What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to a preview of the Bobby Dots conclusion. This is book number five in the Tales from the Pizzaplex series, and we have gotten the titles for the stories as well. The first one, which we are going to be reading a preview of today, I believe, is called GGY, or Gregory, because that one is about the arcade machines in the Pizzaplex. Uh, and then the second one, I can't remember. Oh, it's called the 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 Creator or something? I can't remember. Wait, the storyteller. It's called the storyteller. And then the third one is called the Bobby Dots Conclusion, which concludes the story from uh, Summer Canophobia's The Bobby Dots Part 1. Anyway, uh, let's get to the point. We are going to be reading the preview that we have. Oh, here we go. It says here. <laughs> Oops. Um, oh, it's actually called Bobby Dots Part 2. That's interesting. Um, but yeah, let's get straight into GGY or Gregory. A barrage of thunder rattled the school's old murky windows just as Mrs. Soto wrote on the blackboard. Fiction stretches the boundaries of reality. Tony glanced from Mrs. Soto's precise block letters to the plump raindrops that were now pelting the, the window nearest to Tony's desk in the back row of the musty, high-ceilinged classroom. Tony blinked. No, no longer interested in anything Mrs. Soto was doing, he put all his attention on the storm. For just an instant, Tony could have sworn he'd seen something moving in the downpour. An elongated, human-sized shape seemed to have slithered through the torrents of water just as the, the thunder's rumble had faded away. But that, of course, wasn't possible because Mrs. Soto's creative writing class was on the third F... Oh, it says F law, but it's supposed to say floor, <laughs> floor of the... 120 year old limestone school building. The only thing Tony could have seen out in the rain, 40 feet, 45 feet above the ground, was something falling or flying. Tony wished he could get up and go look out the window to see if anything had hit the ground, but getting out of his seat would have earned him one of Mrs. Soto's dirty looks. He hated those. Letting Mrs. Soto's voice merge with the rain's thrumming rhythm, Tony resigned himself to simply wondering about what he'd seen. And that was okay. Tony liked life's little mysteries. Poking around to find answers to why things happened fascinated him. Tony continued to watch the rain as he pondered what he might have seen. It hadn't been a person, obviously. If a person had fallen from the rain, Tony would have heard the splat ever, uh, even over the sound of the storm. And surely someone would have screamed. Or maybe not. Sometimes bad things happen right under people's noses. Danger lurked everywhere, even in the places you thought were safe. Many of Tony's investigations had taught him that. Thunder boomed again. The whole building shook this time. Two seconds later, Tony saw piercing white tendrils of light streak down in the halls uh, in front of the hills behind the school's grounds. That was close, he thought. On the heels of the lightning, a tree branch speared through the rain. It shot downward, then disappeared out of view. That must have been what he'd seen, Tony realised. Some of the trees on the school grounds had pale grey bark. He wasn't sure what kind of trees they were. The sudden squall had come out of nowhere. One minute, the hundred foot trees that guarded the school grounds like a stoy, stoy, stolid, stolid line of stern principles had been still, their branches limp and relaxed. The next minute, the tree's branches had begun to whip around, tossed by wind guts, gusts that arrived with no warm warning. Oh my gosh, sorry, I keep messing up. Life was like that, Tony thought. He'd learnt that from his investigations too. One second, all was well. The next second could bring surprises of the worst kind. Something prodded Tony's shoulder. He gasped as he spun to his right. Space out much? Tony's best friend asked as he leaned across the space between his desk and Tony's. He handed Tony a stack of pale blue papers. Tony grinned nonchalantly, as if he hadn't nearly just jumped out of his skin. He took one of the pieces of paper. They were assignment sheets, he realised. Mrs. Soto's colour-coded her handouts. Blue was for writing homework. Uh, or blue was for writing homework. Tony leaned across the aisle and handed the rest of the assignment sheets to Zoe, the pretty blonde girl who sat in the desk next to his. Zoe didn't even look at him as she took the stack. She was one of the popular girls in the seventh grade class, several rungs above Tony and his friends on the school on the social ladder. Tony glanced down and read the assignment. He sighed. Another fiction story. In preparation for his goal of becoming an investigative reporter someday, of investigative, oh my gosh, investigative reporter one day. He was only twelve, but he believed in planning ahead. 
Tony had been eager to hone his writing skills in Mrs. Soto's class, his non-fiction writing skills. The class syllabus had said it would be about all aspects of good composition, but so far Mrs. Soto was focusing only on fiction. Outside the rain stopped as suddenly as it had started, a shaft of sunlight shot through the wet window, throwing prisms of refracted light across Tony's desk. He put his finger in the pink and yellow streaks that played across the scarred, dark-stained oak. See, he thought. Reality was much more invest interesting than fiction. Now that the rain had stopped, Tony could hear the assignment sheets rustling as everyone in the class read over what they were supposed to. Several kids started murmuring to one another. Tony could hear his friends whispering next to him. The creative writing classroom was surprisingly not particularly creative in this appearance. Although nearly all the other classrooms in the building were decorated with posters or charts, whatever was related to the subject matter being taught in the room, this one was oddly bare. The yellowish plaster walls held nothing but the blackboard at the front of the room, a whiteboard on the inner wall, and a shelf of novels at the back. The 15 desks that were lined up neatly in the middle of the room weren't enough to fill out the vast space, so sound tended to bounce between the bank of windows and the other barren walls. Even the quiet noises seemed amplified. Okay, hush please, Mrs. Soto called out. Tony looked up from the blue paper he held. Mrs. Soto's gaze met his. He smiled at her. She didn't smile back. Although she was one of the younger teachers in the school, Mrs. Soto wasn't one of the friendlier ones. Tall and thin, Mrs. Soto dressed solely in dark brown and tan, and she wore her brown hair in a blunt, chin-length style. The bottom edge of her hair was so straight that it looked sharp, like it could cut her jaw if she moved wrong. Mrs. Soto was a good teacher. Tony had learned for a lot from her, um, even though he, she didn't assign enough non-fiction. He often wondered, though, why she was so unhappy. He'd like to write a story about that. The goal of this story, Mrs. Soto said when the paper rustling and murmuring died down, is to focus on a mystery while also wrapping it uh, in subplots that seem to have nothing to do with the rest of the plot, but actually are essential to it. You'll work in teams of three. You can pick who you work with. If anyone needs help partnering up, let me know. Any questions? She looked out to the class. This is my kind of assignment. I would love to do this, honestly. <laughs> I love writing. Uh, I need to do it more. Tony raised his hand. What if we can find a non-fiction story that fits the description? Or a non-fiction mystery that fits the description, he asked. Mrs. Soto shook her head. You can let reality spark your imagination, she said, but I want you to look past the real world. Just as Mrs. Soto finished speaking, the bell rang. It was Friday, and this was the last class of the day. Half the kids in the class were out of their seats before the bell's insistent buzz ended. Tony didn't move. He frowned at the assignment sheet, his mind already starting to toy with ideas for the story. He was going to be the one who would take the lead on it. He always was. Um, as usual, the three amigos, oh, great and wondrous, great American writer. Tony's best friend asked, wait, I'm so confused, <laughs> uh, pulling Tony's attention from his thoughts. I don't know what that line was. Tony glanced at his friends. We've already picked our num de plums, the, the curly black haired kid who Tony had been friends with ever since their moms across the street neighbours had brought them together for a play date when they were four years old, flashed his signature lopsided grin. I'm going to be Boots he said. Tony shook his head. When his friends had learnt the term nom de plume at the start of the year, they twisted into nom de plume. What does nom de plume mean? I think it means word of... word of plume? I don't, I don't know what plume is. <laughs> um, or name, name, sorry, name of... name of... Pl I don't know. Name of plume. <laughs> I'm just gonna say name of plume. Um, since then, they'd insisted on choosing different pen names every time they got a new writing assignment. For the duration of the assignment, they demanded that they call one another by the crazy names they picked out. Tony stood and stuffed his assignment sheet into his backpack. Why boots? he asked. For puss in boots. Clever cat. That's me. Did this book predict uh, <laughs> the, the puss in boots movie? Okay, got it, boots, Tony said. He's going to be Dr. Rabbit, boots said pointing at the last of the three amigos. Tony looked at Dr. Rabbit and lifted an eyebrow. Why Dr. Rabbit? You can call me Rab for short, Rab said. He shrugged. The name just came to me. He grinned as he ran a hand through his unruly brown hair. He'd admitted the week before that he coloured himself. It looked it. 
Rab was a relatively new friend, spotting the unfamiliar kid who'd looked like a little lost at the start of the school year a couple months before, Tony had introduced himself just to be friendly. He and the new guy had hit it off, and Tony had invited him to work with him, and Boots, when they'd gotten their first creative writing assignment. Rab pointed a finger gun at Tony. What about you? Tony thought for a second. I'll be Tarbell. Boots grabbed his backpack and started toward the classroom door. Don't tell me, Boots said, looking back over his shoulder. A reporter, right? Tony nodded. He didn't bother to explain that Ida Tarbell was a famous muckraker in the late 19th century uh, late 19th to early 20th centuries. Neither Boots nor Rab would have cared. Their interest in the history was even more non-existent than their interest in current events. <laughs> Same. Uh, as Tony followed Boots and Rab from the classroom and the three of them started pushing through the th throng, not thong, throng of kids <laughs> filing the hall, filling the hallway, ah! Uh, Tony wondered, not for the first time, how much longer he and Boots and Rab would be friends. Over the summer, Tony had started feeling a little impatient with his best friend Boots. It felt like Tony was starting to grow up, but his long-term friend was content to stay a little boy. Adding a new friend to the mix had helped a little because it shook things up a bit. Rab was kind of halfway between Boots and Tony. He liked to cut up and goof off, but he also had moments when he said interesting, even deep things. More than once, Tony had caught Rab with a rigid expression on his face, as if he was contemplating something in intense. Tony had a feeling that Rab had layers that Boots would probably never have. Tony had a terrible feeling that he was outgrowing Boots and might soon want to hang out with Rab. That would be awkward in the extreme. Tony realised he was lagging behind his friends, and he hurried to catch up. Hey, you guys want to get together and start brainstorming ideas for our story? He called out. <laughs> um, what was I going to... Uh, I don't know what I was going to say. I was gonna, <laughs> sure I was going to say something. Um, never mind. Boots and Rab turned and looked at Tony. Boots rolled his eyes and Rab shook his head. The story can wait, Boots said. We were just talking about hitting the arcades at the Pizzaplex. Tony twisted his lips in frustration. But the best creative ideas can't be pushed out, Rab said. They need to sprout from the fertile soil of distraction. Case in point, Tony thought. Rab could definitely be deep. They'd reached the end of the hall and started to make the turn down a side hall that led to their lockers. Boots sidestepped a couple of 8th graders, one of whom deliberately bumped Rab as he passed. Rab's eyes narrowed as he gave the jerk a hard stare. Of course, the guy, a popular kid, the girls fawned over, didn't even notice. Tony and his friends tended to be invisible to most of the kids in their school. Tony acted like he didn't care, but he was lying to himself. Tony, who loved trying to get to the bottom of life's mysteries, had spent hours attempting to figure out what made a kid popular or not. He'd reached some obvious conclusions. Being a nerd, for example, was not the way to popularity. Neither was being funny looking or having strange habits. Speaking up too much in class was a surefire way not to be popular. So was dressing wrong. But there was something intangible too. There had to be, because Tony and his friends weren't nerds. They had no strange habits. They didn't talk too much in class and they dressed like everyone else. They also weren't bad looking, or at least Tony didn't think they were. Tony and Boots and Rab were all dark haired. Tony's hair colour was somewhere between Boots', Boots jet black and Rab's chocolate brown, and all had pretty regular features. Boots was probably the best looking of the three amigos. The tallest boy in their class, Boots, was wiry, had deep green eyes, a normal looking nose, a mouth that was usually quirked into a grin, and a square jaw. In contrast to Boots, Rab was one of the smallest boys in their class. He too was skinny, and because his skin was paler than Boots' rust, uh, dusty skin, um, Rab could appear a little weak and frail. He had big brown eyes, and those made him look like a wide-eyed little kid sometimes. But the rest of his features were fine. Tony had overheard a couple girls say that Rab was cute. Tony's height was somewhere between uh, Boots' tallness and Rab's shortness. Tony figured he was average for his age. Maybe he'd always be average. Tony had dark blue eyes that might have been a little too small and a little too close together, but they weren't weird looking. His nose didn't have anything odd about it, and his mouth, though a touch small, wasn't goofy looking. Maybe his cheeks were a little pudgier than he than was ideal, and if they were less so, his Aunt Melva might not pinch them every time she saw him. But he didn't think any of these features were cause for social exclusion. Earth to Tinkerbell! Tony was jerked to the side. He blinked and realised Boots was dragging him through their lockers. Uh, towards their lockers. 
It's Tarbell, Tony said automatically. Not Tinkerbell, says you, Boots said. It's going to be Space Cadet if you don't stop standing in the middle of the hall looking like your brain took a vacation. Sorry, Tony said. I was just thinking. That's your problem, Rab said as, as they reached their lockers. He began spinning the numbers on his lock. You think too much. That's bad for your health. He's right, Boots agreed, flinging his locker door open with a resounding bang. The door bounced back and almost hit him in the face. He didn't seem to notice. Tony stepped over to his locker, whipped th through his lock combo and opened the dented metal door. Unzipping his backpack, Tony swapped out some notebooks for what he needed to take home for the weekend. Come on, come on, Boots said, bouncing on his heels like he always did when he was impatient, which was nearly all the time. The Fazcade is waiting. Oh my god, the Fazcade. I still think we should start brainstorming, Tony said. Boots snorted. The story's not due for two weeks. We've got plenty of time. We'll be able to knock out the story in a few hours, Rab said. Why do you? Why do now what we can put off till later? Besides Tinkerbell, Boots said, bumping Tony's shoulder. We know you'll get started without us. You always do. Tony sighed and slammed his locker shut. Part of him resented his friends for just assuming he'd do most of the work on their story, but part of him was relieved. He always got excited about a new writing product, project. He planned to work on it every day and he'd have fun doing it. Uh, there's two pages left. Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Flex was exactly as its name advertised. It was mega. Even though Tony wasn't quite as into the place as his friends were, he had to admit the Pizza Plex was ginormous, and every square inch of the entertainment complex was stuffed full of dazzling and fun sights and sounds and experiences. Tony and his buddies had tried every venue in the massive domed compound. They'd ridden the high-tech roller coaster a dozen times, explored the climbing tubes. <gasps> you know what that means? This is Oh my god, wait, 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 wait. This is massive. This is massive. The climbing tubes aren't in the... The... The, the security breach pizza plex, is it? That's, that's from Haps. Isn't it? Am I, am I being stupid? Because if that's from Haps, that means that the pizza plex we're seeing in these books are exactly the same as the game's pizza plex. That would be amazing. Uh, let me keep reading, though, because there might be other details. Um, played countless rounds in the course at Monty's Gator Golf, bowled a bunch of times at Bonnie Bowl, oh my gosh, and raced frequently at Roxy Raceway. They'd also seen so many animatronic stage shows that Tony could pretty much sing the band's songs word for word. The best part of the Pizza Plex, though, at least in Tony's opinion, was the largest of the Dome's multiple arcades. The Fazcade, a three-story arcade connected with spiral staircases, billed as a disco arcade, the Fazcade was the home of DJ Music Man, an animatronic DJ that spun tunes for the arcade's game players and for weird people who used the karaoke rooms on the Fazcade's third floor. That actually exists in the Pizzaplex. Oh my god. I'm so happy. Tony thought anyone who wanted to stand up and sing in front of other people was totally bonkers. Lit with the same amount of over-the-top multicolored neon lights and LC LCDs that radiated through the pizza plex, the Fazcade had eye-popping purple walls and plush light purple carpet that was patterned with stars and swirls like and likeness of Freddy Fazbear, the animatronic bear that was the linchpin of the, the Fazbear Empire. Sorry, I keep rushing. This purple backdrop was stuffed full of shiny chrome and painted metal game machines in nearly every colour imaginable. The Fazcade was so iridescent that Tony always felt like he was leaving the real world and entering some kaleidoscopic parallel universe when he stepped into the Fazcade. It wasn't just the sights that transported you to another realm in the massive arcade, it was also the sounds. Overlaid with the pulsing bass beats of the tunes that DJ Music Man played, the arcade was an eruption of noise. It was like an auditory multiverse. Layers and layers of sounds were packed together in the Fazcade. Sometimes, because he liked to try to describe things in his head to help him be a better writer, Tony picked out uh, every sound he heard in the arcade, but he never felt like he could pass them out. The machines pings, zings, zips, dings, buzzes, pops, trills and gongs and the players shouts, laughter, chatter and whoops converged on one another and just became one compressed din that made Tony's head hurt sometimes. Like today, probably because he would have preferred to kick around ideas for their story assignment instead of playing arcade games. And that's it. That's it for now. Wow, that's that's a great start. Uh, I did not think it would start like that, honestly. 
and I did not think it would actually live up to to its name, but it seems like it's going to be. It's going to be a story about Gregory, which is crazy because that means that Gregory exists at this time, right? And if we think Gregory is a robot, then... Because obviously he was a missing child as well. Like, I don't know. We're starting to piece things together, I think. And hopefully the story is going to give us more insight on who Gregory is. But maybe not. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I think the story is going to be really good. I think this entire book is going to be amazing. Um, but it's coming out in March, I believe. March 6th? It's something like that. But uh, I guess I'll see you then. <laughs> Thank you for watching and I'll see you. Goodbye.